Welcome back, guys. It's Steve from Featherlight. In this episode, we're talking about one of the most important things in all of audio production, and that is gain staging. No other single thing affects your setup or your mix or your master more than gain staging. So let's dive in and talk a little bit more about what this is. So today we're recording four different kinds of microphones, all with radically different gain requirements. So this is a really good time to talk about what gain stage is. And the very first consideration we're gonna have in gain staging is what's called the signal to noise ratio. And what that means is when we plug this microphone, for example, into our audio interface or into our mixer or into our microphone preamp, the very first thing we have to do is set that gain or trim knob so that our signal is the most robust that it can be, that it has all of that dynamic range without clipping or distorting the input. And I don't mean distortion in a cool vibey analog kind of way. I mean it in sort of an impossible to fix sounds like ass kind of way later. And immediately you can hear that sounds pretty bad. Check one, two. Check. The other thing that we need to contend with is the second part of that equation, signal to noise, is the noise. Noise is created by all kinds of gear. So even the best microphones in the world produce some noise. The best kinds of audio gear produce some noise. So if we get that signal and we record it too low, and then we have to bring it up later in the mix and we start putting compressors and equalizers and things on it downstream, that signal is gonna be noisy. And that's just one signal. If that one signal was recorded many, many, many times, like for example, doing background vocals or lots of stacked tracks, that one noisy track times 30 is gonna get really noisy. And then we have problems that we cannot fix later. So the problem with getting the gain stage wrong in the beginning is twofold. One, distorted tracks. But two, when you distort or clip a track or you record the track too low, what you actually do is you rob yourself out of some fundamental frequencies that need to be there in the signal to be able to hear that signal correctly. And finally, one of the last gain staging considerations is anytime two pieces of hardware are connected together. So it's not just the input gain that we need to be concerned about, it's also the output gain. Most pieces of equipment, for example, a microphone preamp like we have here, is gonna take a microphone input and the gain stage needs to be adjusted accordingly. However, its output won't be. It outputs line level signal, even if it's on a connector that looks like a microphone. With this case here, we may need an adapter cable that is female XLR on one end and terminates to a TRS quarter inch plug on the other. That signal is still line level signal. And when we connect it into our mixer, we don't want to connect it into the microphone connection because that's going to be another preamplifier. Instead, we want to hook it up to the line level input of your mixer or your audio interface. This will ensure that we bypass that unnecessary gain stage of the microphone preamplifier. And lastly, we need to make sure that that channel's input gain or trim knob is set at its unity position, which is usually signified by a marking somewhere on the channel. If your audio interface doesn't provide any kind of unity markings on its gain knob, simply set it at zero, go back to the device feeding it and set its output at zero, and then bring up the input of your interface until you get the desired signal. What we want to avoid is having the output stage of one piece of gear be louder than the input stage of another, which effectively just means we're overdriving it like a guitar amplifier. If you are using a microphone preamplifier that might be going into your audio interface, then we would need to adjust the microphone preamp's input gain and also make sure that our meter on the preamplifier itself is reflecting the input stage and not any processing after the output stage. And we'd like that to be hitting right around zero dB with the highest peaks a little bit higher. We want to leave ourselves enough headroom to make sure we get a nice clean recording into our digital audio workstation. If instead we're going directly into the audio interface's mic input jack, the first thing we want to do is go into the console application in the computer and make sure that all the relevant settings for that input are correct. So for example, if the mic needs phantom power or if we need a pad or any of those things, those might be physical switches on the outside of your interface or they might be handled in software. Then we make the relevant connections and bring up our input so that we have a nice strong level but that it's not going into the red. Check, check, check and then back that off just a hair so that we have a nice strong level into our DAW, but it's not so low that we get noise later. 
In this next example, we're going to be gain staging a small drummer's submixer that has his kit mixed the way he wants into a larger mixer that's currently being set up for a live recording. We're going to be going out the main outputs of the small submixer into the two available line inputs of the larger one. We are going to set the smaller submixer up at its unity position or zero on the slider. And this is to ensure that we don't overdrive the inputs of the larger mixer. And to guarantee that, we're going to use the mixer's solo function. What the solo feature does when it's engaged is mutes the other channels and sends what's called a pre-fader level to the main fader's meter bridge and allows us to very accurately measure only what's coming into the channel before it ever goes down to the rest of the channel. This allows us to set the perfect distortion-free input from our submixer without being fooled by the channel's volume slider or EQs. Once our submix level is all set, we can disable the solo feature and then bring up the sliders to taste for our live recording. All right, so first microphone up we're dealing with is this guy. It's a U87 style microphone, a Neumann U87 style microphone, which means that capsule is very front forward. So it has a lot of high end information in the capsule itself. And you can tell that because of the frequency response chart. If you look it up for this particular microphone, it'll clearly show you that it's got a little bit of a bump here in the high end. All microphones have this frequency response chart in addition to having the polar pattern as well. And the polar pattern will tell you what type of microphone it is. Are you getting sound from all around the microphone, which would mean it's an omnidirectional microphone? Or are you getting sound from just the front of it? So it's a kind of cardioid microphone. So the farther off access I get, the quieter my voice will become until I get right back on the front of it again. All right, the next consideration is this guy. It's the Shure KSM44. And its gain structure is a lot different than this. These are both condenser microphones, so they both require 48 volt fan and power to work. The difference though is this one has a lot lower output. So we need to turn our gain knob up higher to match the same apparent volume as our U87 style microphone. But we get a lot for that difference. This has an incredibly low noise floor. And this is one of the reasons why it's so popular for vocals. It's got a big kind of silky top end to it. It's got kind of a low end sort of uh, low mids presence to it, which makes it a really warm microphone, wonderful on vocals, but a different gain structure altogether. So that has to be changed in our audio interface to make up for that difference. And if it didn't have a really low noise floor, as we turn that up, we'd start to hear a lot of that noise. So thankfully, this is a really, really low signal to noise ratio. And those specs are published at the manufacturer's website. We can look up all these microphones and see exactly what that figure actually is. And that'll tell us if we need a microphone, for example, to record really quiet sources, we're gonna need a microphone with a really low noise floor. If we're recording really loud sources, for example, then the noise floor isn't gonna be nearly as big a consideration. Something to think about for each one of the mics we're looking at here. Even though its characteristics are very similar, it's also a condenser microphone, but the Shure requires a bit more gain to achieve the same level. So this microphone requires about 50 to 55 dB, depending on the application, for it to work effectively. And we're going to check what that input looks like by engaging the solo button like we did on the previous channel, and then going back up and adjusting that gain knob until we're right about where we need to be. All right, the third of our condenser microphones here is this hand-wired boutique mic from a company called Kano Audio Works, and it's interesting kind of gain staging consideration is that much like the Shure KSM model, it has a much lower output. So we need to turn our gain up higher to accommodate for that difference. However, this is a big full sounding microphone. It's really scooped in the mid, so it's got kind of a hi-fi sound. So where this is a much flatter and much more accurate microphone for different sources, this is a much more colored microphone. And as a result, we might need to turn it up quite a bit more to match the apparent loudness of the other two microphones. However, it doesn't have quite the signal to noise ratio this does. Not dramatically different, but enough of a consideration so that, for example, if we're doing a lot of vocal overdubs and we're gonna stack those tracks on top of one another, we might wanna choose a microphone with a little bit lower noise floor to do that kind of work with. All right, our fourth microphone in our 
radically different gain stage considerations here is our Shure SM7B. Now, this is probably one of the best known vocal microphones on the planet for YouTubers and voiceover artists and any kind of radio announcers and things like that. This has been around for a long time and is very well known for that. It's also the only one of the four that is not a condenser microphone. So this is a dynamic microphone, which means it's gonna have a couple of attributes that are different than these three. So first it has what's called a proximity effect. So when I move closer to the microphone, my voice gets boomier and bigger sounding. That's great for voiceover, but may not be for other kinds of sources. And the second is that because it's a dynamic microphone, it has less output than these three. That's a huge consideration if your audio interface or mixer or microphone preamp does not provide enough gain to make this work. This needs about 60 dB of clean gain to make it work effectively. And there are lots and lots of audio interfaces, mixers, and microphone preamps that do not provide that kind of gain. So in that case, a cloud lifter or a fed head, which is an inline device that kind of tricks the mic into thinking that it's a phantom powered device and adds about 20 dB of gain. That might be an option you want to look into, but it's about half the cost of the microphone. So that may or may not make sense for you. So the number one consideration because of that low output is of course the signal to noise ratio specs. We can go onto the manufacturer's website on Shure's website and we can see that it has pretty high signal to noise ratio, which means that noise is going to be apparent when we turn it way up to make it work. This microphone, unlike these three, has an incredibly high SPL rating. What that means is this can accept incredibly high sound pressure before the capsule itself will distort. So just like if you distort the input of your audio interface, you can actually distort the capsule of a microphone as well. Sounds just as bad and is just as hard to fix. And you can already see that even at the same gain position, we are really struggling for gain here. We're not even close to the apparent loudness of the other microphones. So we're going to turn this all the way up here. And even at its full 60 dB of gain position, let's go down to the meter bridge and take a look at where that is. Fader up to Unity and check our solo input level. And we see that even with that full 60 dB of gain that our microphone preamp can provide, we are a little bit under that. So it's just peeking up there in the yellow. Check, check, check uh, when we get on it. But we are really just using every single dB of that microphone preamp's gain structure. All right, next up, let's move on to synthesizers and instruments and other line level sources and deal with the gain stage considerations that they present as well. We're going to start off by recording our Yamaha Mox F8. It's got a ton of different sounds. It's a workstation with lots of different voices uh, and it's very dynamic. So we're going to set our connections up first and we're going to be going into inputs five and six in the back of our mixer. All right. So with our synthesizer plugged into inputs five and six and we've set our input gain knobs to be about the ballpark or where we think we need to at least start. Let's check the level about where that is. All right. So you can see that that's showing up pretty low on those levels. So let's raise the gate knobs up a little bit and then check the sound again. All right, so that is a lot closer to where we need to be. That still puts it right about the sweet spot. We don't want to go too much hotter than that, only because synth sounds especially are very dynamic, and you want to make sure you're playing the busiest or loudest part of the sound, as you want to leave yourself a little bit of headroom. But that's a nice full sound. Next up, we're going to be tracking our guitar player directly into our audio interface to reamp later. But he'd like to play through his amp while we do it. So we're going to use a direct box. We're going to plug him into the input, and then we're going to take the output or through out of the direct box and plug that into his amplifier. The direct box is going to take his high Z guitar input, and it's going to transform it into a low Z microphone output which we are gonna take and run direct to the console. So that allows us to record him completely dry and him to hear his amp. This process is known as reamping and we got a great tutorial on that right here on the channel. All right, so we have James tracking directly into the console via the direct box, which we're gonna reamp later. And the one thing we need to make absolutely sure is we need to adjust his gain so that he never clips the input. And it's really easy to do when you're recording guitar directly to the console 
The same thing goes for recording bass guitar and really almost all instruments because they're so dynamic at this stage. We need a good strong level that can never clip the input. And the reason being is that when we go back to reverse this process and play it back through his amplifier or to use software-based modeling to get that guitar sound, that clipped or distorted input going into our audio interface hardware won't sound like guitar. Instead, it'll sound like the audio example for the vocal that we played you earlier, and that's going to be just as hard to fix in guitar as it was for vocals. All right, so there's a brief look at maybe one of the most important steps of the audio engineering process, and that's gain staging in the analog hardware end of things. We'll see you guys in the next video where we're going to dive deep into the digital end of gain staging and how it applies to your digital audio workstations.